Hello and good morning. My name is Mike Cornell and I'm alongside Coach Ron Lathy. And Coach and I would both like to welcome everybody right. to March. And we are excited to study God's Word morning. And as we get started, we have three things we would like for you to consider and to think about. And the first one is this. How do you know when the Lord is calling you to action? And this is a really good spot because that's a really good question, right. Coach. To stop for just a second if you're a note taker, grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, grab your Bible, and follow right along with us here today. The second thing is, how do Christians live as exiles in this world? And then finally, what can get in the way of us worshiping as a church and as individuals? And today, we actually begin a new quarterly study titled, God Frees Redeems. And Coach, here we go. Last week, we finished up the, the very last quarter in the book of Job. This week, we begin our quarter in the book of Ezra. And we're going to be in Ezra chapter 1, looking at verses 1 through 8, verse 11. And then we're going to slip over to chapter 2 and look at verses 64 through 70. And the title of our study this morning is called Freed from Captivity. And Coach, could you get us started with some prayer and just kind of set the stage for what we're going to study today? Sure, let us pray. Most kind and loving Heavenly Father, again, Lord, we humbly come before you this morning just first of all thanking you for all the blessings, Lord, that you give us. Thanking you, Lord, for being the wonderful Father that you are. And Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to come uh, to, with you today and, and Lord, to bring your message to those that are watching. Lord, we just ask that you bless what we're trying to do today as we open your word. And Lord, we just pray that uh, you, would, you would be with those that are, could not get out today or uh, those that are hurting maybe in hospitals or in uh, nursing homes or maybe homebound and just ask you to, to minister to them wherever they might be. And Lord, we just thank you again, Lord, first of all, for your son Jesus who uh, paid the ultimate price so that we might have opportunity to one day spend our eternal life with you. And Lord, as we open uh, your, your word this morning, we just ask you to open our hearts and our minds and, and uh, lead us with your spirit as we start this new quarter. And, and may this, this be the kind of lesson that will touch the hearts of people out there that are listening today. This we ask your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah, we're back into uh, something we actually studied a little bit last quarter, Mike, from the book of Ezra. And uh, Ezra is normally tied together when we study with the book of Nehemiah. Right. Uh, these two came back uh, from captivity in Babylon. And we'll try to kind of set the, uh, the back and tell people what was going on before this happened. But we know that God's people were taken captive by the Babylonians. And uh, because they, they were not following his, his law and they were rebelling a little, a, a little bit and they were not following what he had told them to do, then he warned them that they were going to suffer the consequences, but they still wouldn't get the relationship back on what they were doing. So God let the Babylonians come in and, and basically uh, sack Jerusalem, destroy the city, destroy the beautiful temple of Solomon, and they paid a heavy price. For, for their disobedience. But in the meantime, uh, it's, it's been about 70 years since that happened, and uh, the prophet Jeremiah said they would be there for 70 years and then return. So now today we're going to be looking at their return, at least part of, of the return. And the return we know happened in stages. The first group that came back, and there were a little less than about 50,000 of them, came back to Jerusalem basically to rebuild the temple. And we'll be talking a lot about that today, that, that return. And then a little bit later, about 80 years later from that, Ezra actually comes back with his group. And there were only a couple thousand of, the, of them, but he brought mostly some, the Le Levites and the priests and that, that made up the uh, body that would took care of the temple. And of course, they were coming back to take care of this new temple. Uh, so, you know, we've got a span of time here that we're talking about, but we do know that, uh, that the idea of them returning was of something that God had promised he would do. He was not going to forget them, but they were going to have to suffer the consequences of their, 
uh, of their sins uh, before he did. So we know that, uh, that Ezra is bringing a group back, as I said, more for uh, the religious services. And the first group that came back were the, the more of the construction engineers to, to rebuild the temple and get it back up. And yet they still haven't got the walls of Jerusalem up yet. That's going to come a little bit later as well. So uh, this is a whole rebuilding process now about getting the city built, the temple built back up, and everything. So uh, we're, we're going to find that we're moving from the, the team or Babylon who had conquered them have now been displaced at, in power by the, the Medes and the Persians, which basically came to be the, the Persians. Uh, and the Persians, uh, Persia was like where modern day Iraq is. And uh, their king was named King Cyrus. And the interesting thing about King Cyrus is that before he was ever born, he was talked about in the Old Testament by the prophet Isaiah. And this, you know, you know, I, I, I'm a prophecy buff here, and, and I really love to see how these prophecies are fulfilled. And that proves that God is, is the ultimate. You know, he's, the, the Bible is the only religious book I know that has prophecy that have been, re, been fulfilled over and over and over again, right down to the last detail. And he even called Cyrus by name. Right, he called him by name. That's exactly right. So, and Cyrus is, is the Persian king, and we're going to find out that God actually uh, was able to stir his heart to get him to do what was in God's plan. And we'll, we'll kind of talk about that as, as we go as well. But King Cyrus, we know King Cyrus was, when he was ru a ruler, and they even have evidence from in the uh, museum at London, England right now called the Cyrus Cylinder, right. where he describes what he does. Uh, he is favorable when he conquers a, a country or whatever. Uh, he likes to let them go back and, and, and start their own religion back up again to kind of keep them peaceful, I think, you know. So he's got some political motives here, but deep down we know from what Isaiah sh said and, and from what we see in our lesson today that this was God's hand in all this, bringing this prophecy, prophecy to fulfillment. Yeah, it really is. The, the time for God's people to return home, finally, has just arrived, right. just as the prophet Isaiah had said. And this is where our lesson begins with the first group that Coach talked about of returning Jews. And that takes us to Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. And here we see the author. And God's word says this. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. So the phrase, the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia doesn't mean the first year of his reign over Persia. No, no, this, this is simply <clears throat> when he is uh, king and he receives this, basically, you know, I don't know if he got a vision. I don't know. See, at the same time that this is going on, Daniel was probably still around and, yeah. you know, to, and he had a high position, we know, in the, in the government. Of, of Babylon and it was transferred to Persia. So he probably had talked to Cyrus and Daniel knew that this captivity was about to be over because the 70 years that it was prophesied for was just about up. So Daniel, I, I have no, no doubts but what he talked to the king and said, King, uh, you are in our prophecy. And, and, you know, he may have talked to Cyrus and told him about what God had, had wanted him to do but in any event, we find King Cyrus here is, is now ready to fulfill this prophecy that was spoken by the prophet Isaiah and also by Jeremiah. And, and now Daniel's just kind of maybe filling him in. So, uh, so it's just amazing what God has done prophetically here and how it's come about. Well, it talks about a proclamation here, <coughs> which is something in itself. Not only did Cyrus issue a verbal proclamation by sending a voice throughout his entire kingdom. And he, he, he put it also in writing so that it would be sent to those, really the distant provinces where the 10 tribes were scattered 
really in Assyria and, and some other parts of that area too, Coach. But, you know, it's been said uh, of Cyrus that he didn't know God or how to serve him. But God knew Cyrus right. and knew how to serve himself by him. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting when you look at it like that. God governs the world by his influence on the spirits of men. And whatever good they do at any time, it is God who stirs up the spirit right. to do it. Right, and, and we're going to see many times, uh, well, you can see it throughout the Bible, that God uses men to, per, to do his purposes. And oftentimes it's, it's pagans. And they don't even know, you know, don't know him personally. And, but he, it says he stirs their heart. So somehow God gets them to do what he wants them to do. And, uh, you know, we talked about Isaiah prophesying. Uh, one of the verses in Isaiah chapter 44 says, uh, that says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform at my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be rebuilt and to the temple your foundations will be laid. So not only did God name him, but he told him what he wanted him to do. Yeah. He's going to lay the foundations for the temple itself to rebuild. So again, it's just amazing that God is able to do that with somebody that doesn't even know him, you know, uh, other than what he's heard about him. Yeah, God stirred the heart of Cyrus to the point where Cyrus felt a conviction that it was time for a call to action. Uh -huh. and, and that's what we're seeing played out here. And that really, Coach, takes us to a really good question, that very first question we had, because we're going to see <laughs> the Jews who have been exiled for seven years actually answer that call to action uh -huh. as well. And th I think there's a good lesson there for, for all of us to follow. How do you know when the Lord is calling you to action? <laughs> Yeah, and there's you know a lot a lot of ways people can you know some people say that they hear God's voice, others other people say that you know God reaches them in a dream or and we see different versions of this throughout the Bible. So I'm not disputing any of them. You know I don't know, but you know I think that the first thing that God does is is He convicts a person of, of a need. Yeah. You know, he reaches into their heart and it says he stirs their heart that there's something that needs done and he would like for them to do it. You know, put something in their heart to, 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 want, to want to do what he's asking them to do. And then once, once you step into the point where you're willing to serve God, then you're amazed at how many doors suddenly open up that you never think about. But he is very good at opening doors and leading you through, the, through things that that uh, lets you do the serving that he's asking you to do. You know, so he's always a door opener. And then the last thing he will do is he will supply and he will equip you for whatever that need is. Sure. So, you know, that allows you to step, if you believe that, that allows you to step out in faith that God will help you do what he's asking you to do. You'll never, you'll never go through this alone. So, uh, you know, I think that's kind of how you know more, at least for me, it's, it's always been that type of thing where uh, I don't hear voices. I don't, you know, you know I just feel in some way that this is what, you know, I'm being called to do. So, you know, everybody probably has a little different answer for that. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it is. You know, Cyrus definitely had a different answer right. than what we would. Cyrus, you know, we're not really sure what his relationship was with God. You know, many people feel like he, he respected the God of the, the Jewish people, uh -huh. but that he also respected other pagan right. gods. Um, but, you know, in answering this as a Christian, before you can dis discover God's calling in, for real, uh -huh. specifically, you really must have a personal relationship with uh -huh. Jesus. And, you know, Jesus offers salvation to every person, and he wants to have an intimate relationship with each one of his followers. So, but God reveals a calling only to those who accept Jesus as Savior. Right. And anytime we want to hear from God, the message is the same. It, it's through prayer, it's through reading the Bible, it's through meditating. Sometimes the message comes through godly friends, right. patient listening. Uh, but God's <coughs> scriptures that call us to action are a real blessing. And there, there's really five, and a couple of these you just mentioned, yeah. 
First of all, if God's calling you something, you're going to feel a sense of urgency that requires you to trust God. The second one is you sense God is asking you to surrender something to him. It might be uh, your pride. It might be idols. It might be your own self-determined plans. And the third thing is you feel led. The thing you feel led to do requires reliance on God and not yourself. <laughs> That's right. what a lot of people right. forget. And the fourth thing, you can't see that God has equipped you, or you can see, and you just mentioned this, you can see that God has equipped you to do the hard thing uh -huh. that he's asking you to do. And then finally, God is asking you to believe in him in new ways. Mm -hmm. That's why it's hard to begin with. Right. And it requires faith, which right. a lot of people don't. That was my very next word. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> That's good. All right, let's go on to verse 2, and here we see the proclamation. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. So the title, the Lord God of heaven, that's being used here, identifies the Lord as the supreme authority and power. So Cyrus is getting it. Yeah, and again, whether it's a you know, direct word from God or vision or whatever, or it's what he learned from Daniel. You know, we don't know where he's getting this, but uh, it is interesting that he uses uh, the, uh, the Lord, the God of heaven, uh, because again, he's, he's used to pagan gods and that are, you know, he has here on earth, he can, you know, probably idols, wooden idols and stone excuse me, idols and everything. And, and it's quite a jump for him to depend on something he can't see. And, and he calls him the Lord of heaven because uh, God is basically, by this time, uh, we know that the, the spirit of the Lord and uh, the uh, presence of God has actually left earth and gone to heaven. Right. And we see that back in Ezekiel uh, and uh, uh, we hear about the, the, the spirit of God uh, leaving the temple and uh, going to the to the wall and and even hesitating to see if the people will will return to him, and then he, and then the spirit goes on to the Mount of Olives it says and they stops and looks back again to see if they will return and they don't get it they don't return to him so uh, he he just goes on and, and goes to heaven and remains there his his uh, spirit so it's not like it he had it at the beginning of in the temple where he would meet them at the Holy of Holies. Well, everything you just described, Coach, is, is where the term Ichabod uh, comes from. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who have never heard that term, it basically just means <laughs> the Spirit of the Lord has left this place. Right. And that's what had happened to the nation of Israel and, and to the folks in Jerusalem. And <laughs> here, here the, the, this is a testimony by the king, King Cyrus, that we're talking about here. And here the king's testimony to the sovereignty of God was probably just a formality mm -hmm. for him. But since history reveals that he had similar things, or, or that he had said similar things about other gods, and <laughs> but now that God's people were returning to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, proper worship was to take place there. Right. And I think King Cyrus was one of those guys that he was more politically motivated yeah. than anything else. He was kind of cover, covering his rear, as they say, <laughs> with all the gods. You know, he didn't want to make any of them mad. Yep, that's, that's the way most people uh, assess him. All right, let's go on to verse 3. And it says, Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem, and may their God be with them. So Cyrus was giving all the Jews that were in his dominions the freedom to go home. Right. Right. And, and again, uh, he's fulfilling prophecy, maybe without even realizing it. But, but, but the thing that we look at here is, and as we'll talk about as we go along, uh, you would think that there would be great celebration in the, in the Jewish community there. And, and I'm sure there was to some extent. But we find out that when Cyrus told them they could leave, you're free. You're not. You don't have to stay in Babylon any, or Persia here anymore. Uh, you would expect them to to go back in droves, 
but you know I think it's our, our human instinct sometimes some of them must have had it pretty good yeah because they did not leave they, they and this also shows the they're still having rebellion against God they were not willing to go back under God's rules and and, and everything so they did not really come back uh, totally as a nation and, and they pay for this later on so here we see uh, as we said there were there were less than 50,000 of them a little less than 50,000 that went back to Israel uh, and they went back and, and the other people <laughs> stayed and, and did not go back until some of them went back later on like we said it was about three three groups that ended up going back eventually but an awful lot of people stayed in uh, Babylon and where they were settled and a lot of reasons you know it, it was about we figured out it was about a 900 mile trip on foot back to back to Israel but so they probably a lot of them were older at this time uh, you know any of them that would have would have come in, a, in the from Jerusalem and were still alive they would be very old by now you know so the trip may not have been able for them but the younger ones especially still a lot of them even stayed and wouldn't go back so there wasn't that national pride there wasn't the pride of being God's people and they ended up staying in Babylon again so and that just kind of reminds me of people today who are are deciding that they kind of like the world the way it is yeah. and they're not sure they want to come to God right now and they're not ready to come to God uh, so this is a picture of that happening to the nation of Israel. Well, today, you know, if you don't come to God, there is a time when it's going to be too late. Yeah. So they need to understand that. Well, history is really clear about where Cyrus stands with, with God. It, uh -huh. You know, that he, he respected the God of Israel, but he also had respect for pagan gods, which right. weren't real. But one thing is for sure about Cyrus's stance on the God of Israel, he knew that that was Israel's only God. Right. And, and he paid recognition to that. And they were obligated to worship him only and particularly in Jerusalem. Uh -huh. So he wanted to establish that uh, channel for them to go home and to worship their only God. And according to Cyrus's proclamation, the Jewish exiles could expect God to help them. Uh -huh. They weren't just going on their own. They weren't just, uh, and the king was giving them all the resources they needed. And, uh -huh. you know, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. But he not only gave them the resources they needed, but he reminded them, your God will be with you right. the entire journey. Right. And that brings us to our first practical point, Coach. God can stir up the hearts of even kings to fulfill his purposes. Yeah, we kind of touched on that a little bit earlier, but you can look throughout history and uh, biblical history especially, you can look and find several places where God has, has taken even pagan kings and leaders and got them to do his work for them. And this is just an example here we see with Cyrus. Uh, so these pagan leaders that are led by God, they can do extraordinary things that you wouldn't think they would be able to do, but through God's help and, and God using them, uh, the, they can do extraordinary things. You know, we even know that uh, we've had, you know, even the Babylonians we talked about, God put it in the heart of their king to attack Israel. Yeah. And it was because of punishment, you know. So, you know, it's amazing that God can get these pagan kings to do his will even though they don't believe in him. You know, they don't, they don't, they don't realize what he's doing. And we, we also know at the end of the Great Tribulation, which we talk about in the book of Revelation, we know that God, God is going to persuade the leaders of all the nations to bring their armies to Israel and to Jerusalem and surround it for the Battle of Armageddon. And he's going to put it in their minds that they need to come. And, and uh, just like he's done with Cyrus here and, and other leaders, and they're going to be... Uh, uh, convinced to bring the, their armies to the Battle of Armageddon, uh, you know. And in addition, I, I mean, you, th this is something a lot of people don't realize. God is going to actually persuade the Antichrist to turn and destroy 
the the end times church, who has really put him in power. Yeah. And you know, so God is still in control. We need to understand, no matter what's going on in the in the rest of the world. Well, he he's definitely in control and directing this initiative for the Jews to leave Babylon and, and return to Jerusalem. And, you know, they had been exiles, the, the Jewish people had been exiles in Babylon for 70 years, like you talked about. And that, that word exile is an interesting word when you think uh -huh. about it, Coach. And w when you apply that to, uh, to us today, how do Christians live as exiles in this world? Well, you know, I... We're exiles because, as we we often hear it said, this world is not our home. We are actually exiled from where our home is, and uh, so we today, as Christians, know that we are we will be going home one day to our real home. But as of now, we we are kind of exiled down here on this planet, so to speak, and we are called exiles because of of our sin and disobedience, just like Israel was here, you know, because we're all sinners, we've all sinned, and, and uh, we know that uh, even in this, air, in the, on the earth here, we may say we own this property. No, we don't. There's nothing that we own or that we have that's actually eternally ours. Right. It all belongs to God, <clears throat> you know. So again, we don't even have things of our own. We don't receive any eternal rewards until we get home, you know. So again, that we're still exiled from those kind of things, but one day we will get a chance to return home. All of us will, but we've got to to make sure that we have plan, made plans for the trip. And the only <laughs> way you can get your ticket punched is by Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, that's <clears throat> a really good point. You know, you think about this question, Coach. And I, I really, I really thought about this quite a bit. And for, for everybody listening, for Coach and I, everybody is one of three people. And, and listen closely to this. You're either an immigrant, you're a tourist, or you're an exile. And let me tell you what I mean by that. An, an immigrant, an immigrant is someone who seeks to make their new country their permanent home. That's a great idea for earthly citizens, but it's a disastrous idea when you apply that spiritually. Right. And, and sadly, this is what's really bad, Coach. A lot of Christians do, do this with the world. They might know that they are citizens of heaven, but they treat the world as if that's really where they want to live. Right. That's an immigrant. The second one is a tourist. A tourist, in many ways, is the opposite of an immigrant. Right. Tourists might love the country they're in, but they don't plan to live there. They're just visiting, so they never put down any roots. They don't form any real connections to anybody or any place, and they stay huddled in their own little groups. Yeah, That's what tourists do, and they stand detached from the society around them, and when problems arise, either politically or spiritually or whatever, tourists don't respond by getting involved. They leave. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, th and the problem with that is, this is the attitude that a lot of Christians today have toward especially the world. Right. They stay separated. They never get involved. They feel no connection to the community, and they certainly don't engage in societal problems. And then the third one, you have the immigrant, you have the tourist, and then you have the exile, and you just described the exile to the T. The exile is someone whose home is somewhere else. Right. And... But for an undefined amount of time, they have to make their home in a different place. Mm -hmm. And that's the way we are as Where Christians. We are, right. And even as, as we put down roots and work for the good, we always long for the day when we can go home. And our home is in heaven. Right, right. And that takes us to verse 4. And it says, And in any locality where survivors may now be living, the people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So not all the Jews returned with these guys, these guys like you mentioned earlier, Coach, but they had ownership in the project too. Right, because they, they were told or by the, this decree, they were decreed by the king that they were to provide support provide money, provide gold things, 
and they were to provide offerings for the temple as well as for the people going back. And, and it's interesting here that, that Cyrus basically uh, took the Jews kind of like under his wing and uh, as he was supposed to protect them to make sure they got to do what he was told he was supposed to let them do, you yep. know. So, because uh, he provided even armed escorts to take them through hostile areas. And, and uh, so he wanted to make sure that, that he did what, the, what their God told him to do. And so it's interesting here how these Jews lived 70 years in exile and now suddenly, you know, they're going to go back to their homeland, rebuild their Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, and they have absolutely no, no material goods to right. do it with. Yep. So now it depends, they're totally dependent on King Cyrus, who is basically being led by God to do this. So God still has his hand in it. Cyrus is providing these things, but only because God is providing for him. So it's interesting here that that, uh, that Cyrus himself even brings out the old temple implements and gives them to the people to take back. Uh, you know, and, and we, we find out that, that uh, it was surprising that they had even survived. And if you don't know the story about the temple implements, it started back in Babylon uh, when they were having a drunken, drunken party <laughs> at, at uh, King Belshazzar was having this drunken party and they were using the implements of the temple to drink out of and, and defile them. That's what they did. And that's when we, we hear the idea of the handwriting on the wall. Well, that's exactly what they saw at that Literally. party. <laughs> yeah, and it wasn't because they were drunk they saw it. That God put his hand out there and he wrote on the wall and that very night was the night that Babylon's king was was taken prisoner and killed uh, by the Persians. Yeah. So uh, these these implements were then taken back and put in the temple for uh, the Persian gods. Marduk, I believe, was the Persian guard or god. But the interesting thing, Mike, was that these are things that are made out of solid gold and yeah. solid silver. And you would think that those pagans would have melted it all down and, and made, you know, made them rich. But again, you see God's hand in it that there was nothing that was destroyed of the temple. And now it's being given back to these people and they're going to take it back to Jerusalem. Well, God knew this day was coming. Right. And, and God kept, that, kept those gold figures uh, safe so that when the day came that the temple could be restored not quite like it was in solomon's day uh, but it was going to be restored to a much better place right. than it currently is and, and you know in addition to financial aid and, and really logistical supplies for the returnees cyrus included voluntary offerings for the temple right and, and that's a lot of what we're talking about here uh, this is just a part of it right and that takes us to verse five and we're going to combine <clears throat> No, we're good with verse 5. Yeah. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So the, the Jews prepared to begin their journey home. They were led by the chief of the fathers of Judah and Benjamin. That's important. Yes, it is, because the tribes of Judah and Benjamin basically made up what was known as the southern kingdom. Right. Uh, the northern kingdom was the ten, ten tribes, and this was the southern kingdom made up of Judah and, and, uh, and Benjamin. And so those are the main people that had been taken to Babylon in, you know, in, uh, uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar when he conquered Jer Jerusalem. So the heads of those two tribes uh, and the priests and Levite, everybody that God had touched their heart, Okay, they, they came together and prepared for this trip that they were going to take. And, of course, they had to take back all, all the, the temple implements. And, uh, and we're going to see that, the, that Cyrus provided a lot of other things for them to, to carry as well. But we find out that, uh, you know, they are getting all this ready to build the house of the Lord again. 
This is the temple that we're talking about. So uh, we know that, that uh, the king did everything he could do to help them. And we feel like that uh, uh, not all of them returned, we know, and we're not sure why, but, but we know that they did not, not all return. But I know that uh, they, these people that did return, they were following what God had called them to do as a nation. And they basically became the new Jewish nation at that time. Yeah. And, and all, I just wonder, all these people that stayed in Babylon, uh, I, just, I just can't help but think that, that that was a regret for them because they missed the, the great things that happened with you know, rebuilding the temple and everything. So, uh, and that also kind of makes me, I wonder how many things you and I, Mike, are going to be shown that we could have had if we would have just followed God's leading. Yep. You know, I have a feeling he's going to show, show us different times in our life. You could have done this. You could have had this. I would have blessed you this way, you know, and we're going to feel a lot of regret when we get there. How many call to actions right. did we walk by through right. our life? And, but, you know, th this was a, an all-new generation of Jewish people right. who had never been to Judah before. Right. All they knew of Judah was the stories that were secondhand to them. So they were stepping out on faith to go and do this. But they had a great example that, that probably uh, was told to them from the time they were, were little Jewish boys and girls to this point in their uh -huh. life. And that was their father, Abraham. Right. When Abraham left, not knowing where he was going, he followed God's will in the same way. And God can, wherever he pleases, incline the hearts of strangers to be kind to his people and make those strength to strengthen their hands that have weakened them. Right. And I, and I also like that since we mentioned two of the tribes here, Benjamin and uh, uh, Judah, uh, the other 10 tribes, uh, you know, we, we hear about the, tw the 12 sons of Jacob who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and as if you study this, you know that, first of all, when they got to the promised land, the tribe of Levi was not given any part of the promised land because they were the priests right. and the ones that provided the uh, religious uh, leadership and everything at the temple and really all over the land. So they were kind of scattered all over the land to be used for that purpose. So they weren't given a section of the promised land like the others were. And also uh, we find that, uh, uh, that Joseph, who of course was in Egypt at that time, and Joseph never came back to the promised land. Yep. So there's no section of land that went to Joseph. So people wonder, well, what happened to the 12 tribes? You know, when you hear about it, well, to, what happened there was that instead of the Levites and Joseph, it was replaced by Joseph's two sons, uh, Manasseh and Ephraim. So that's how the 12 still remained a 12. And, and a lot of people I know wonder about what happened and how uh, knowing what happened to the Levites and, 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 and Joseph did not get a piece of the land. So that's how God kind of set it up. Yeah, and they're, they're going to go back and set it up exactly the same right. way. And what the Levites actually did was they would actually reside in, in a city with each, in each one right. of those areas. Right. And that takes us to our next practical point. God will provide leaders to us where he wants us to be. How, how profound is that? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, you know. We have seen in our in our lesson today how God is, takes a leader and gets him to do what he wants him to do. Well, God picks those leaders, and and whether we like it or not, God puts. It says in the Bible that God puts kings and and leaders in in position. He puts them where He wants them, and uh, you know, and depending on what He's going to do with that particular country or that particular section is the kind of leader that he uh, puts there that can do his will that whether he know it or not. Right. And he can, he can use that person to get his program or his, his purposes uh, done. So uh, we, we find that, that if, a, if a nation is truly a godly nation, I think God will put more of a godly person in control 
to try to keep them there and keep the, and that's what he did with the kings of uh, of Israel. So, but if a nation is not following God's, he may put someone there that will lead them just opposite of where they where they would like to go. But where he would want them to but go. But where he wants them to go <laughs> out of punishment. That's right. You know, so people need to understand that. The leaders that are leading the countries are there because God puts them there. Yeah. And, you know, you look at that statement that God will provide leaders to us where he wants us to be. Uh-huh. You can take that same statement, Coach, and insert it in churches yeah. in today's world. Yeah. Uh, really, really interesting concept there. All right, we're going to go on to verse 6, and we're going to combine verses 6 and 7. And it says, All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts, in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord, which Nebuchadnezzar had carried away from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. So just as the king commanded, everyone who was around the Jews encouraged them by supplying them with valuables. All right, and, and that goes right back to what we mentioned earlier about when God has a purpose for something, he will supply what you need. If he's called you to be like he did with uh, uh, Ezra and and uh, the ones before, if he pr- tells you that, that you're going to do something for him, he will provide and give you the opportunity and the material things you need to get it done. And that's what you see going on here again. And it's it's the fact that King Cyrus is is issuing the decrees. But God's issuing the decrees to King Cyrus, yeah. and and we see how it's how it's playing out here, to so that it works exactly as God has set it up to work, you know. So uh, again, and the, and the here it mentions the it mentions the implements that I'd already talked about of the temple that are still there, still just like they were when they were taken from the temple, and now they're getting ready to be taken back home. Well, here's the other interesting thing about that, Coach. You know, God made sure that the vessels of the temple were not lost, which uh-huh. we've talked about, that they weren't metal, melted down, but they also weren't mixed with other things. No. They're, they were easily identified, and so now these vessels were being taken back to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Here's what's interesting about that today for us. Likewise, God takes care of his living vessels, of whom it is said, the Lord knows them that are his and they shall never perish. Although these vessels have been put into idols' temple and probably used in the service of idols, they were given back to be used for God. And that's all God wants from us right. as his vessels. Right. And another thing along that line is the fact that, you know, when, when God calls you to do something, we get caught up in, well, I don't think I can do that. I don't have the ability to do that. And that kind of brings a, a, a saying that comes to mind here. God doesn't want our ability. Right. He wants our availability, right. <laughs> you know. And, and that's what's happened here with, uh, with Ezra. God, God's doing all the work, or, or King Cyrus is doing all the work through God. So we don't even hear much about Ezra right now. Right. All right, let's go on to verse 7. Or we did that already. Let's go to verse 8. Accepting resources, Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithridath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. So the vessels that the king had removed from the treasury were entrusted to Mithridath, the uh-huh. treasurer. We already talked about him a little bit. Uh-huh. Yeah, he, you know, as you said, those implements... They didn't have to go run through, run, uh, rummaging through the closet to find out where they were. They had them in a special place yep. and, and even put Methodath in charge of them. He should have even known where every one of them was. So that's why the king went to him here. So, And uh, then uh, Sheshbazar is, is the, calls the prince of, Ye- of Egypt, or prince of uh, Judah, rather. And we know that... that uh, he was kind of the one that it was entrusted to or given to. He was in charge of getting them back to Jerusalem. Well, God wants us to open ourselves to his guidance, and, and that's what he's asking for here. Uh-huh. 
for he has already appointed others with greater means and greater resources to bless us along the way. God wills for us to be his, his coalition of the willing. And it's like you said a while ago, Coach, he doesn't want us for our ability. He wants our availability. Right. And that takes us to the next practical point. Man may use God's vessel for evil, but God can use those same vessels for good. And we see that played out right in this story. Absolutely. Uh, you know, again, the, the, the king of, of Babylon were, was using them for a party, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, a drunken party. Uh, but God could still use those same vessels uh, for his purposes, too. And that's why he protected them. He, he didn't let anything happen to them. He knew, as you said, the day was going to come when he would get them back yeah. and they would take them back to the temple. So he had protected them for a long time. Uh, and we need to, uh, again, you kind of <coughs> alluded to this too, we need to realize that God can use the same, that same thing for human vessels. You know, you could use a human vessel for evil but God can turn around and use it for good. You know, we think of people like Paul, who were who was someone who had mistakenly uh, started persecuting Christians and even uh, having them killed. You know, because he didn't know until he met Christ, and and then Jesus was able to totally turn him around for Christ, and he became the greatest apostle and greatest evangelist ever. Yeah. So so God certainly can use material vessels or he can use our vessels uh, uh, you know our bodies as vessels for good if we just let him yeah all right let's go on to verse 11 and it says in all there were 5400 articles of gold and of silver shush bazaar brought all these along with the exiles when they came up from babylon to jerusalem so the exiles returned to jerusalem with the articles for the temple according to the decree that Cyrus had made. Right, and, and, and again, to me, it's still amazing that, that there were that many of these things that God protected and nothing had happened to. And they knew right where they were, they could find them, and, and they, they brought them out without a, apparently even having to look for them. So uh, if you got that much gold lying around and silver, I don't know how they did not melt it down. You know, oh, yeah. You know, it just, uh, it's beyond me other than the fact that God protected them. Yeah, God longed for a nation that would obey him. And the new chapter in Jerusalem represented a clean slate and a fresh opportunity to please God. That's what these people have. All right, All right we're going to move on to chapter 2, verse 64, and we're going to combine with 65. The whole company numbered 42,360, besides their 7,337 male and female slaves, and they also had 200 male and female singers. So chapter 2, verses 1 through 60 is not part of our text here, but those verses give, an, give really an itemized account of the number of Jews. Right, and again, the, the Bible is very, very specific here, as we can see, right down to specific numbers of how many came with them and and again, this, this to me is, is simply God being God, uh, so no one can dispute this, because I'm sure it's in record maybe in, in the, the history of Israel or whatever, and they probably have that number written down somewhere. Well, God makes sure he uses everything exactly, yeah. uh, so that there's no question that the Bible is his word. And, and again, uh, this precision is just amazing to me. Yeah, it really is. The numbers are so accurate. So we're going to move along and we're going to combine verses 67 through 68. And here we see their composition. They had 736 horses, 245 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. When they arrived at the house of the Lord in Jerusalem, some of the heads of the families gave free will offerings toward the rebuilding of the house of God on its site. So, of course, the Jews were going to need livestock. Right. Yeah. And part of it's food and others, you know, the, of course, the horses and donkeys were, were used uh, in, as uh, work animals, you know, as well. 
And so God, again, provided. He thought of everything, everything they needed. And what they still needed, then the other people provided by these free will offerings. And they were giving just like we, we give uh, at the church. You know, they were giving to the temple. And, and again, persuaded by God, I'm sure, to do so. He touched their hearts and they fr excuse me, freely gave these things because it was for the cause of the temple itself. So again, we see all these things just numbered down to the very specific one. You know, there, were, there wasn't 735 horses, there were 736 <laughs> horses. Yeah, you know, they did, God didn't even round it off. You know, he, he keeps it very, very specific. Not to be mistaken for 737 <laughs> horses. That's right, you know, so. <laughs> well, the, the community that returned gave generously to the temple. And, you know, we talked about Father Abraham just a minute ago. And, you know, they had a, an example of how to step out on faith and to follow God into an unknown uh -huh. project or path. Right. Uh, so they had that example yeah. to get started. And now when they arrive at the temple, you know, David is known as one of the greatest givers there, there ever was, especially among the Jews. Uh -huh. So they also had that example. Yeah. They had Father Abraham. They had David yeah. uh, to lead them, their, their witnesses to lead them down this path. And that really takes us to that third question because there had been a lot of disconnects for the nation of Israel to truly be able to worship God in a way that they used to worship 70 years prior to this. And that, you know, there are things today that, that disconnect us. What can get in the way of us worshiping as a church and as individuals? Well, unfortunately, we live in a time where there are many distractions. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's so many things. But probably, Mike, I think the, the greatest thing that keeps people from being able to worship in church is not preparing before they get to church. Good one. You know, that you have to prepare to wor worship God. This is not something you just come in the door and suddenly, uh, you know, you're able to worship. This starts, you know, earlier it should because you need to start getting things like any sin in your life that's keeping you and the, your relationship with God uh, separated you need to try to get that taken care of if you have problems with somebody else either in the church or not in the church you're supposed to go to them and try to get that settled because those are all things that you think about if you're truly trying to be like what God wants us to be those things enter your mind and Satan uses those to distract us. You know, we're supposed to leave all that stuff outside and already have it taken care of before we come inside. So that's, that's preparation for worship. And, you know, to the, I think that's probably the number one thing. Uh, we need to leave our problems outside mm -hmm. and not try to bring them in. Uh, we need also what what I say not major on minor things, you know. Too many times we get caught up on, on uh, the little picky things that really aren't that important and that can cause us to not focus on worshiping God, you know. And, and uh, it's just, just looking at things from, you know, you, you might not like the pastor's sermon what he's talking about. <laughs> You might not think, well, that, that pastor should have a shirt and tie on, and he doesn't. You know, little things, that I, those are minor things as far, in God's house. You know, but we, don't, we can't major on those kind of things. Uh, we need to always make sure that we're, we're keeping our focus on, on the leader of our church, and, of course, that's Jesus Christ, not right. the pastor. Right. And, and then the last thing I had is just modern day, leave your cell phones at home. <laughs> that's a good one <laughs> well you know you, you look at this question and, and we could both answer this question for the next hour we're not going to by the yeah. way but you know anything Satan can use to distract to discourage or scare Christians from assembling together he's going to do it right. and he has done a magnificent job of that and I don't say magnificent in giving him any glory at all but look what uh Satan has used COVID-19 to do to the church right. and to our society and culture in general. Matter of fact, I saw a survey recently, Coach, that said 40% of 
of the people who were attending church pre-COVID will never return again. Yeah. So not only is he preventing some people from, from getting back to church that want to be back at church, he's actually given some people an avenue never to return right. to church. Right. Some people, uh, their health prevents them. Some people have a fear of not being accepted when they go to church, fear of conviction. Uh -huh. uh, some people have a fear of being judged. Uh, fear of maybe actually having to do something to serve, that, that prevents people from yeah. coming. Fractured relationships, either outside or inside the church, prevent you from coming. And it, uh, let's just face it, especially this has been proven out in the culture we live in today, it's just easier to stay at home. Right. It really is. So why go to church that looks like the world on the inside when you can experience that on the outside. So those are some of the things that Satan wants you to think about. All right. And that takes us to our next practical point. If God promises to bring us where he wants us to be, he will provide for our needs. Yeah, that we're just, this just kind of summarizes the kind of what we've seen throughout the lesson. It really does. Uh, because of the fact that the Jews, all they had to do was get themselves there. Everything else God yeah, provided. That's right. You know, so, yeah, there's, there's not a lot there. He's going to supply everything. God supplies everything, I think, except your sweat from hard work and your faith for stepping out. Yep. I think that's the only thing he doesn't provide. Yep. Good points. All right, we're going to go on to verse 69 and 70. According to their ability, they gave the treasury for this work 61,000 derricks of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priestly garments. The priests, the Levites, the musicians, the gatekeepers, and the temple servants settled in their own towns, along with some of the other people, and the rest of the Israelites settled in their areas, in their towns. So here we see, in other words, they gave according to what they were able to give. What a wonderful set. Uh, that's the same way that the early church, the New Testament church got started. Everybody gave what they could give, you know, and that's what's happening here. And, uh, you know, that shows again that they're, uh, they're providing things that they need uh, for God and not thinking so much selfishly about themselves. So uh, w w that's a, a great way to start off the church or, or, or the, uh, in this case, the temple. And, uh, you know, the, the, the gold they talked about, according to uh, my commentary, said that's about 1,100 pounds yep. worth of gold. Right. You know, man, well, that's, that's put that in today's money and see how <laughs> far it goes. Uh, and then also 5,000 pounds of silver. And, and then the, they had the garments for the priests that they said. Uh, which are were very elaborate garments, uh, you know. So they provided, you know, the offerings here were really, really sacrificial offerings, and they were uh, willing to give as much as they could give. Yeah. Though they had little, they were settling yeah. into houses of peace and happiness. Coach, can you imagine that? Yeah. After <laughs> seventy years, content just to be home yeah. with the blessings of God's favor. Right. And that takes us to our very last practical point here this morning. And that is those who love the Lord will give of what they have to the success of his ministry. Right. And again, first thing that caught my eye on this practical point was for the success of his ministry. Right. You know, too many times we get caught up in our own ministry. And we, we tend to, to not realize it's not our ministry, it's his ministry. And if, you, if you're doing it for your ministry, you're doing it for the wrong reason. Right. So you have to have the right motivation, and the motivation is to do it for God. Uh, and and uh, so uh, if, we, if we truly love the Lord, it means we're going to be motivated to uh, give, bring honor and glory to him and not to us. But, you know, that, that's the... Uh, the, the love that we show for him. And that's what he's saying here, I think, uh, more than anything else. Well, th this whole story, this whole narrative that we've covered here this morning really has two main points to it. 
and that is first first of all we learn that God's people should be encouraged by knowing that as we pray for God's will to be done our Lord will move hearts to accomplish his plans and his purposes that's the first one uh-huh. the second one is we learn that as Christians we also should not miss when God speaks to our own hearts when opportunities join in his work come our way. Uh-huh. That's really what the whole gist of this is about. Right. And that takes us to our thought to remember, and that is this. Rebuilding requires courage in envisioning a new reality. And Coach, what a great statement to, to sum up this, this wonderful story that we've read. Uh, and could you finish us up here today and, and uh, just wrap it up with this thought to remember. Sure. Uh, rebuilding. You know, it, it doesn't matter whether you're rebuilding a, a church or a temple as these people were. Uh, you're rebuilding your life. Maybe you got off track and you want to rebuild your life or you're rebuilding the relationship with God. Uh, the thing we need to realize is God is more than willing to help you in that rebuilding process and he will provide what you need as he's shown here uh, and the idea for each one of us is we if, if our relationship needs rebuilding or rekindling with God that's where we have to start and when we start our rebuilding process with him the first place you have to go is to Jesus Christ and once we make the step of accepting Christ as our Savior and knowing that, that it is because of his sacrifice that we can even offer ourselves to God and even think about having eternal life with him. We, you know, there's nothing that this world could ever provide that would ever uh, be worth what you're doing by giving your life to Christ. You, sometimes you've got to give up something to get something better, and that's exactly what you're doing as a Christian. And, and we have to believe in Jesus Christ. We have to accept him as our Savior. And then we have to be willing to obey, be obedient. And then comes the things that God will ask us to do, like we've talked about here today. today. But first, you've got to be, uh, as we talked about, you've got to be available to him. And that doesn't happen unless you first accept his son. Yeah, and, and really to do that, you've got to answer this question. You know, I mentioned three types of people earlier coach uh-huh. and, and each one of us have to answer this question are you an immigrant are you a tourist or are you somebody who's an exile right. and, and each one of those have different meanings that's the question we all have to answer and before you can answer that question which number three is the right answer by the way yeah. uh, you do have to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior And if you have any questions about that we would love to have a discussion with you about it and, and maybe help you understand, lay out a path for you. It's a very, very simple process. And you should see the contact information above my head on the screen. This is Pine Grove Baptist Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia. For those of you who watch week to week, and maybe this is your very first time, we would ask you to share this message with your friends out on Facebook or whatever social media platform you subscribe to. We're out on about every platform uh, that we can. And we thank each one of you for making us part of your day. We don't take it uh, for granted, and we, we do see it as a very, very dear privilege. Next week, the title of our study is actually going to be Free to Worship. And it's going to kind of be a continuation of our story today, Coach, and we're excited to continue on with that. So until next week, this is Mike Cornell along with Coach Ron Lathy and our production manager, John Ayers, Wishing everybody to have a blessed week, and we hope to see you real soon.